From the beginning of time, there has been a cry for peace. Several thousand years ago, in biblical time, Jeremiah 6.14, Jeremiah cried out, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Fast forward to 1775, Patrick Henry's speech to the Virginia Convention. Peace, peace, there is no peace. Fast forward to the riots in California in 1992. Rodney King, brutally beaten by the LA police said in today's vernacular, can't we just all get along? As I speak right now in this moment, in light of the tragedy in New Zealand, there is a cry for peace, peace. Metaphysically, peace means the harmony and tranquility derived from awareness of Christ consciousness. This morning, I'm going to explore peace in current and relevant ways. First, looking at the peacemaker and how it intertwines with social justice. And then, of course, inner peace and how that intertwines with our character. The United Nations deployed troops to the war-torn Darfur region of Sudan. Their purpose? To help create conditions for sustainable peace. They were not called soldiers, but peacekeepers. And they were armed with the latest weapons. I asked myself, were they what Jesus had in mind when he uttered this beatitude? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Who can hope to be a peacemaker in a war-torn world like this? Wars, strife, and turmoil have been part of this world since the beginning. And this is complicated by a long history of fear-mongering in our country, in our world, and within ourselves. Because of this fear, you will remember, we were asked to accept that other people had to be tortured if we were to remain safe. Really? Today, the fear is especially focused on the dangers represented by people with a different religion, color, and immigrants in general. We live in a world that is characterized by fighting and rivalry. We live in an angry and polarized culture where there is inaction on mass shootings and police brutality. Right here in Columbus, there are people taking sanctuary in churches for fear of deportation and separation from families. Every level of society is affected. But right in the midst of this continual strife, God calls his people to be peacemakers. We have to teach ourselves to stop looking at what's happening in the world as abstract and isolated and see that all of this is woven into the very fabric of our own lives. What happens to one happens to us all. Why? Well, you 
know the answer because we are one. So what can we do? As Pope Paul VI reflected, if you want peace, we must find a way to work for justice. He said it means standing up in, in nonviolence resistance to systems of economic, political, religious, and social injustice. Not long ago, I attended a peace and civility workshop, which made quite an impression on me. When you think about it, peace and civility go together like a horse and carriage. You can't have one without the other. To be peaceful, you have to be civil. To be civil, you must be peaceful. So God calls his people to be peacemakers, not peace breakers, who are self-seeking and disagree with everything, and not the peace faker, who will go to any lengths to avoid any kind of conflict confrontation or unrest. In so doing, they settle for a counterfeit peace. That is based on avoiding the real issue. You know, go along to get along. This beatitude does not say, blessed are those who are peaceful. The focus is not on the personality, but on the action of the person. Peace just doesn't just happen. We make peace. Those who are blessed are those who make peace. We have to get in the game, so to speak. An example of this during uh, World War II, is when the president of Columbia University sent a questionnaire to his entire faculty asking what they proposed to do to help with the war effort. One member, the pacifist, sent it back with this answer, mind my own business. <laughs> that may be what a pacifist does, but it's not what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker knows that dealing with conflict is his business. Peacemaking is not a passive characteristic. The language Jesus uses is active. A peacemaker is one who attacks the situation, who confronts it head on. Ernest Holmes, Science of Mind, reminds us that peace and justice including social justice, are both spiritual principles. We need not all be activists, yet as spiritual beings, we are called to support, and herein lies the key, we are called to support a collective conscious awareness of peace and justice in the world. This is how we engage, another, this is another way how we engage in global peace. But first, we must look at how we can find true peace in our own life. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is one of the most challenging of bad beatitudes. It's hard, but Never underestimate that you are called to do a mighty work. And this work is about your character, how you grow, about growing into spiritual maturity. A peacemaker brings peace to others because they have it themselves. You can't bring it if you don't have it. Whatever it is in you will spill out. Peacemaking is more complex and involved than it first appears because it entails the way we live all of our life. 
And this produces peace both passively and actively. Passively, because we are not a cause of disruption. And actively, because we create peace by drawing others to emulate our example and by them seeking for the tranquility and serenity that we have. So the best place to start is with God. Peace is based on the divine law of love. Love is what God is. Jesus taught us that the only love is the love expressed fully and unconditionally. Karen Armstrong, a prolific um, writer, says that we have debased the word love by the way we trivialize it. It's a cliche. I love ice cream. I love that car. I love that movie. I love popcorn. <laughs> it's all about our emotions and senses in human consciousness, but cut off, cut off from the divine source, from divine flow. In ancient times, when two kings said they loved each other, it didn't mean throwing themselves in one another's arms. It did mean respecting and caring about one another. Got your back kind of thing. Love is being at your best, even when the other person isn't. It isn't easy to do this. But we are called to practice, practice this until it becomes a natural response. When we withhold love from those acting in obnoxious ways, we're actually depriving ourselves. We can hate the behavior, but not the person. <coughs> if you're not about loving someone, remember Jesus' admonition. <coughs> As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The rule of love is the law that governs how we treat our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? The neighbor is you. And any person you encounter is your neighbor, whether they're from Columbus, Mexico, Africa, Europe or the Middle East. In other words, love demands that we are to love outside of our comfort zone. Teilhard de Chardin said, the future of Earth does not lie in science and technology, but in the spiritual power of love. We are born out of love. We exist in love. And we are destined for eternal love. So before we can even attempt to become a peacemaker, we must reinvent ourselves in love. Love as if your life depended on it, which it does. All we have to do is follow the teachings of Jesus. Jesus taught us love. He shook up the establishment during his time. He was a rebel. You remember the stories. Yet, he was called the Prince of Peace. He asked that we follow him. And if we are going to emulate him, we must choose to resemble and reflect what most reveals the character of God. The closer we are to God, the more we resemble God. We are called to do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. This is what love is, folks. 
respecting and caring for one another. Our divine nature is pure love, and this is what makes peace possible. To further cultivate inner peace requires building a deep, authentic prayer practice. If we are serious about following the example that Jesus demonstrated, and I say this again, then we too must resemble and reflect what most reveals the character of God through our actions, words, and deeds. Prayer is the only real action that changes character. Prayer is a sacred practice. Emmett Fox said, if you should get a very strong realization of the presence of God with you and in you, it would make a dramatic change in your character so that in a twinkling of an eye, your outlook, your habits, your whole life, in fact, would completely change in every respect. Now this is a bold, radical statement. But nonetheless, it is true. Prayer, by changing your character, makes a new reaction possible. As we practice prayer, we remember our oneness with all life. We envision the entire planet living in peaceful cooperation. We see diverse people, every race, religion, gender, embracing each other's differences and recognizing that we are all children of God. Our divine nature is pure love, so peace is possible. Don't be hindered by what you see in the world. And especially don't be hindered by not seeing the possibility. Remember what is impossible for mortals is possible for God. See the possibility of global peace. Hold that vision. This vision of peace also includes forgiveness of self and others. If you are holding on to some grievance, it's time to let it go. You may have heard the story of a mother who forgave the person who murdered her daughter. She, had, she said she had to free herself. She said it delivered her from evil. This is part of the Lord's prayer. Deliver us from evil. The evil is the bondage of unforgiveness. Trust the injustice you have suffered to God. Don't seek vindication. Don't allow that barnacle to be attached to your heart. Forgive. If necessary, pray about it every day until that barnacle is released, until there is no emotion attached to the situation or person. We have all had relationships and situations that did not end the way we wanted. You may find you're not able to make peace with it. How do you live with it? It's only hard because our ego is running the show. It will not be easy, but I tell you, neither will it be hard if you remember this. Willingness is all that is needed. When you really want to forgive, your purpose now becomes the holiest possible, and all of heaven 
is with you. This is a life journey in which each of us makes progress. So don't quit the journey. Keep at it. Keep praying. The amount of progress may be only very slight, itsy bitsy steps. Nevertheless, progress is there because you cannot pray without making yourself different in some degree. This is why we pray without ceasing. Be willing to forgive. Through our practice of prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, we can engage in global peace through our own consciousness, cultivating peace within, expressing it without, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. And I shared this earlier with one of the members that I personally believe that we are spiritually, spiritually closer to world peace than ever before. Although we may or may not see world peace in our lifetime, through divine love, we can actually do the inner sacred work to consciously lay that foundation of peace for our children and our children's children. And we know that divine love does multiply, right? Being a peacemaker is something we grow into, we mature into. Keep in mind, we may not achieve it in one lifetime, so don't beat yourself up about it for the seeming lack of progress. However, we can let it be our goal. Let it make it our, let us make it our aim our direction. We can do this because this is what Jesus asked of us. He showed us how by the examples of his life. In our lives, self-righteous anger has no role. But righteous anger has a role in peacemaking. Righteous anger is a human energy that fuels and harnesses constructive action for vision and values. It was righteous anger that fueled Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Malala, the young Indian girl who was shot in the head because she wanted an education for herself and other girls. And thousands of others whom we don't know and may never know. You see, anger and nonviolence are not a contradiction. In fact, it can be quite consistent. History shows us Violence has not solved anything. In fact, it multiplies and escalates. Think about this. We killed Hitler, but we never killed Hitlerism. That's evidence by New Zealand, the Jewish synagogue a couple months ago, and the black churches. We killed bin Laden but not the militant, radical ideas of ISIS. We become peacemakers by doing just acts. It allows us to know and gives us courage to do what is right and necessary. It allows us to refuse to torture anyone. It allows us to rescue refugees and help the powerless. Being a peacemaker is a lifestyle. 
You not only answer the call, but you become an example by practicing what and who you really are. Blessed are the peacemakers. You are blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You are blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of competing and fighting. You are blessed when you can help the powerless, the excluded, the marginalized, the abused. Imagine what the world would be like if we treated one another with equal dignity and respect. Rosa Parks said, to this day, I believe we are here on earth to live, grow, and do what we can to make this world a better place for all people to enjoy freedom. We are not here simply to amass more for ourselves. Spirit is calling us to be something more. We would not be living at this time if it were not so. We are to be practitioners of peace and justice in the world. In this one verse, blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus describes the nature of God as nonviolent and peaceful. It does away with any spiritual justification for warfare. It opens us to what the living God is actually like. As peacemakers, we are called to speak out against every aspect of violence, poverty, war, racism, police brutality, gun violence, nuclear weapons, and environmental destruction and at the same time, call for a new culture of peace. As peacemakers, we are nonviolent to ourselves, nonviolent to all others, <clears throat> all creatures, and all creation. And we work publicly for a new world, <clears throat> nonviolent. As peacemakers, we acknowledge it is all one stream of love. We fully recognize that it is God who is doing the loving. And we surrender ourselves to be channels and instruments of that divine flow into this whole world. As peacemakers, we realize we are here by divine appointment. The world needs us now to see beyond seeming world conflict and call forth good. Therefore, to engage in global peace, we work with passion and purpose to further peace by living and practicing the truth that we know, that we all are indeed one. Blessed are the peacemakers, and so it is.